Hi, uh, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I'm very excited to have Robert Lesner, CEO and founder of How with, with me today. Thank you so much, Robert, for joining. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, good to talk to you again. Uh, we, we have talked before, so very excited to uh, chat with you again today. Um, so let me introduce Compound real quick. Uh, Compound is, is an automated uh, money market DeFi protocol which allow automated uh, lending and borrowing. And um, this year is very exciting year. And, and I have to say that uh, Compound is the main reason we have DeFi summer this year. And we now also see a total value lock at uh, Compound um, at uh, $1.7 billion, which is uh, yeah, such a strong growth. Um, I, I know that you actually don't like people to use uh, TBL as a metrics to, to point out which protocol um, is doing well or not, but uh, it's the easier one to use. Um, for, for Robert, um, it's very exciting because he has such expensive experience in traditional finance. And uh, from what I remember, you actually used to be uh, interest rate economist, correct, at a bank. So, so would love to actually hear about that too. <laughs> Why did you decide to move from that to uh, compound? But um, besides having such strong, um, extensive experience um, in traditional finance, Robert also founded two software startup before he co-founded uh, Compound. So um, yeah, really excellent um, career path and uh, very excited to have you here. Um, maybe can you first start off by introducing about yourself and uh, a little bit about Compound, why did you decide to start it um, so far? How has it evolved and your vision and goals of Compound? Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So you touched on some of the points. Um, but I started my career in traditional finance, analyzing interest rates and uh, the risk of different interest rates on a you know, balance sheet. Um, from there, I wound up going into software development and founding two companies that built software. And when the Ethereum blockchain launched, you know, I was amazed that you could create computer programs that could manage assets um, and route value and operate you know, through the logic of a computer program that was embedded on a blockchain for anyone to see and for nobody to be able to modify. And, you know, given my background, when I saw this, it was like this, you know, really powerful moment for me where I realized that there would be an entirely new generation of financial applications that could be built with this. And so Compound started off as really a hypothesis and an experiment because no one had built a system like this before. And we decided that we were going to try to create interest rate markets for different Ethereum assets using smart contracts, which would create a financial market that would operate on, entirely on its own um, without you know, the operations or the headcount of traditional financial markets. And so we didn't know if this would work. Um, it was really an experiment for us at the beginning. And we wanted to really demonstrate you know, how new technologies could be used. Um, since then, we launched the first version of Compound in 2018, and it allowed somebody to earn an interest rate on a crypto asset and to borrow another crypto asset using crypto as collateral. Um, this system you know, has been improving over the last couple of years since then, uh, but that's still the fundamental building blocks that um, creates the Compound financial markets. At this point, there's a total of about three and a half billion dollars of assets earning interest in Compound, and about 1.8 billion of that is borrowed by borrowers. And so, you know, we've really been able to prove that these technologies can build new and highly functional financial markets. Um, you know, I've been amazed by the growth both of Compound and of the DeFi ecosystem as a whole, and. Going forward, you know, I'm really focused on how to make these systems run forever, um, how to make a market that is going to operate for the next 100 years, and really spending a lot of time experimenting with both the technology and the social um, systems that will enable a market to run forever. Mm, got it. Yeah, actually, you talk um, quite a few times before um, I listened to other interviews about Compound being a money robot, yeah? So yeah. this is what you talk about, how it should be running on its own, even if something happened, if, if tomorrow, like something happened to 
the world, it should still continue to be running. Exactly. Yeah. You know, one of the, you know, experiences that really, you know, informed how we thought about Compound was, you know, I was working on Wall Street in 2008 when the financial system started to collapse, right? And there was really two issues, you know, involved. One was that there was no transparency, you know, financial institutions didn't know what their counterparties, you know, balance sheets or health looked like. And so it created like this negative feedback loop of fear. And so there was no transparency and it exacerbated the problem. And the second was that, you know, these markets were really, you know, operated manually by humans. And that led to some extreme, you know, pain points and inefficiencies. Um, and so, you know, as we built Compound, a lot of it's inspired by those experiences where we want a system that's radically transparent mm -hmm. and is completely machine operated, um, mm -hmm. where it's not driven by emotion, where every single user is equal. And it's really just a computer program managing the entire process. Mm, got it. Okay. How, how do you see Compound um, being competitor or I don't know whether it can also work with um, the like of C5, you know, lend, credit lending company like uh, BlockFi, Celsius, Nexo? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So I think that over time, you're going to start to see a lot more usage of DeFi systems by centralized financial players. And you're going to start to see the lines blur where, you know, they might use a DeFi system as the back end to their own centralized business, where they might acquire users and interface with these protocols on behalf of users. Um, I actually think that long term, the market structure that the entire industry operates on is going to be one in which, you know, centralized businesses that um, can offer the best user experience use DeFi protocols on the back end because they know that they're going to operate. Um, they know that there's, you know, reliability and they know that there's, you know, transparency of the counterparts. And we'll see a very blurred system where, you know, individual users will have a choice between accessing a DeFi protocol themselves or using a CeFi product to get the same outcome. Um, and I think it's going to create a really vibrant ecosystem for everybody. So I'm actually really excited about, you know, CeFi uh, businesses embracing DeFi systems um, on the back end of their business. I see. How, how about for traditional finance like bank, like us or Bank of America? Um, how do you see we can interact or work with uh, DeFi players like yours? Yeah, actually, like uh, we are very interested because um, we see such parallelism between traditional finance and decentralized finance, and we would like to see how we can work with uh, DeFi players. Yeah, absolutely. So I think over time, it's the same story where eventually, you know, banks will, you know, deploy capital to, you know, on-chain financial protocols like Compound. Um, you know, it's a question of when, not if, right? I think it's almost guaranteed, but I think it's going to take a couple of years to really start to develop, you know, the familiarity with the markets, the technology and the flows, you know, still the hardest part is converting and going back and forth between, you know, a traditional financial currency and crypto. That's still problematic and a pain point for many different organizations. So I think that eventually, you know, there's going to be seen, you know, to an institution that's almost indifferent between the two, but right now it's still cumbersome to access DeFi. Mm -hmm. I, I want to ask on this a little bit um, about the recent liquidation of uh, DAI borrows on Compound. Um, so maybe like you can touch on upon that a little bit. But uh, from what I understand is that the price of DAI, right, which normally should stay at around one dollar, somehow um, because of Coinbase Pro price oracle, it went up to one point three dollar, and um, it caused the liquidation of some of the DAI borrow. In my mind, I actually think that um, your algorithm compound algorithm worked perfectly, and that's that's what it should happen. But uh, it result in some. Um, you know, unforeseen liquidation when it shouldn't happen. So I'm curious something like this, yeah, how how we could prevent in the future, because like if we're going to have, um, let's say something like this as a back end of C5, right, or traditional finance, um, we have to be able to like intervene or maybe control. So just, just curious, yeah, how we can be yeah, prevented that, in the future. Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, um, DAI is a stable coin that's not, you know, completely stable. There's volatility in the market price mm -hmm. of the asset in different markets. You know, 
the price of dye, you know, has been volatile throughout many periods in history. And it's traded, you know, significantly above a dollar on, you know, different markets many, many times, especially during, you know, big sell-offs of mm -hmm. you know, crypto prices when crypto sells off rapidly. And so, you know, Compound relies on one large trading venue, Coinbase Pro, as mm -hmm. um, a trigger for how to determine the safety of different um, accounts that are borrowing assets. And it's a, you know, it's an aggressive liquidation system where it, mm -hmm. you know, very deliberately tries to reduce the risk to users supplying an asset by closing potentially, you know, insolvent borrowers very rapidly. And so what happened, you know, recently was the market price on this exchange went to a dollar thirty. You know, this was, mm -hmm. you know, real trading on a real exchange. Mm -hmm. Also, what people had to, you know, very rapidly like you know, acquire die to pay back MakerDAO CDPs um, where they were indifferent to the price. <laughs> um, it's happened many times in, you know, this financial market. And a number of borrowers were liquidated as a result of this. Um, and it just used that one um, trigger. And so, you know, it's a great question. I mean, a lot of financial markets experience these, you know, market events. Like it's very similar to the price of crude oil going negative, you know, in you know mm -hmm. many markets you know yeah. earlier this year right yeah, yeah. where you know the contracts are set up in such a way that that's a real event and it's not an event that people anticipate and it can lead to you know significant um, you know changes in you know uh, the health of accounts or in margin or in behavior and you know I don't necessarily think that that's a problem I think what we should do is build systems that you know, the potential, you know, extreme events are, you know, more understood and more known. And we build systems that, you know, are more resilient to them, where, you know, financial products that, you know, behave with less volatility if there's extreme adverse market moves. But, you know, we designed a system where the, you know, it performed exactly um, as mm -hmm. written and intended um, to, you know, reduce the risk of users borrowing by liquidating them. Mm. Got it. Okay. So um, is there any plan in place how to prevent this type of uh, problem in the future? Yes. Yeah, so the best part about Compound is that at this point, it's now a decentralized protocol um, mm -hmm. where the rules can't change rapidly. That's actually the flip side of what gives a lot of comfort and confidence to the users. They know that, you know, there's not anybody out there that can just change the way it operates. Um, that's the flip side of building a system that can run forever. It's not being able to tamper with it. So not only is it decentralized in terms of decision-making, but it's you know a process in order to actually modify the way that the protocol works. So right now, the community, uh, which has full and complete control over the compound protocol, is you know analyzing different approaches and deciding if they want to make changes at all. Um, Many members of the community, you know, believe that the system is, you know, exactly as it should be. So it's really interesting to watch this play out, um, mm -hmm. and you know, watching a decentralized protocol react to different market scenarios. Yeah, no, I agree. Actually, I think that the algorithm did exactly what it's supposed to do. So I, I totally agree with you. Um, so that brings me to the point on the governance. Too, you touched upon it a little bit. So your goal has been to make Compound very decentralized. Yeah, very curious, like, um, how does the process work? If you could share with the audience. So in June this year, you start making it uh, more and more decentralized. So if you could talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. So what's really interesting from my perspective is, you know, trying to understand why a system should be decentralized. Because mm -hmm. in crypto, you know, people try to, you know, use the term decentralization to mean many different things. And it does mean many different things. Um, but there's a huge divide and a huge difference between a layer one blockchain being decentralized and the decision for an application being decentralized. And I think there's extremely different standards uh, between the two. So with a blockchain, you need extreme amounts of decentralization to prevent, um, you know, um, issues with the actual like finality of information to be able to reach consensus about the state of value and balances and wealth and it means something very different for a financial application. Now, the goals of Compound being decentralized are really two things. 
One is that nobody maliciously can ruin the protocol for others. And two, that anybody can upgrade the protocol and contribute changes that are in the best interest of the users, the community, and the system itself. So we designed a system that very deliberately tries to achieve these two pieces, where no one party can move through a change that's hostile. And that essentially means preventing you know, a 51% attack. Um, mm -hmm. And the second is building a system in which anybody and everybody is able to contribute new code and upgrade the protocol itself. And so we designed a system that's not meant you know, for there to be 10,000 participants in the system. It's meant to you know, limit um, any one party from being hostile or collection of people from being hostile and to enable collective upgrading of the protocol. And we've seen both of these things play out perfectly since launching uh, this decentralized governance system. So since we launched this, we've seen, you know, um, no one party having, you know, uh, you know, majority control of the system or being able to cooperate with others for majority control. And we've seen many upgrades coming directly sourced from the community to directly improve the code and the functionality of the protocol itself. Um, where, you know, we've seen most of the changes actually originate from users. At this point, our team has contributed almost nothing uh, to the upgrading and improvement of the protocol over time. And what's interesting is that, you know, a protocol like Compound doesn't require changes on a day-to-day -day basis. It doesn't require the same standards as a layer one blockchain where the security is determined by constant, you know, decentralized, you know, processing. You know, with a protocol like Compound, no action, you know, is potentially valid, right? And you can wait for, you know, changes to a protocol that everybody can agree upon. And that's really the model that we've built. And it's been a joy to watch this play out in the open for the first uh, couple of months. We've seen in total of 30, uh, 32 proposals to upgrade the protocol come out. Mm -hmm. um, I believe, you know, about two thirds of them have passed and upgraded the protocol. And it's been, you know, in a lot of ways, very slow governance, you know, with a lot of agreement from all the different stakeholders before the system changes. And I think it's a glimpse of how these systems will, you know, slowly evolve over time. You know, I think you have a recent one, right? Is it number 32 or 35? I don't remember. I, I remember you, you said you want to abstain and then Ken said he would for yes, <laughs> Ken of synthetics. Yeah. And that was 32. That was the most recent proposal. 32. Got it. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, just curious, like um, any disadvantage that you see at all from being very decentralized governance? Sorry. Did, did you ask about any advantage or disadvantage? No, this disadvantage. Yeah. Seems like you talk about a lot about advantages. Yeah. The biggest disadvantage is that at this point, you know, very deliberately, there's no one you know, party driving the ship. Um, mm. You know, on the leaderboard of governance participants, I'm actually kind of like down the list. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not even in the top five anymore. Um, <laughs> but it's, it's a process in which, you know, anybody can drive the protocol forward, but there's nobody specifically, you know, that's alone driving the protocol forward. Um, and so that leads to, you know, slower upgrades. You know, when it was a fully centralized system, you know, we could very rapidly make upgrades to the protocol, very rapidly, mm -hmm. you know. And now, you know, making modifications to the protocol is slow, you know, and it's a decision on when do you take a system and start to, you know, harden it and reduce the amount of changes so that people can become more comfortable building on it, knowing that it's going to be slower to evolve. Because that's a virtue in a lot of ways, you know. One of the core hypotheses I have is that, you know, Bitcoin is so successful because it doesn't change very much. Everyone knows what to expect from it. Everyone knows, you know, how it's going to operate next month. And changes are very slow and very deliberate and they require a lot of buy-in and support to modify it. And, you know, it's not the latest and greatest technology, but everyone knows what to expect from it. And that's its superpower in a lot of ways. And so, you know, it's also its weakness. And so Compound at this point, now that it's decentralized, that is both a huge strength and a weakness, knowing that it's not going to rapidly change. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Want to ask about 
asset that you have as collateral on compound. I think right now there are nine of them, right? Uh, for example, like ETH, BAT, basic attention token, USDC, USDT, rapid coin, things like that. Um, in the future, is there any plan to include real world asset like, um, like uh, tra um, trade, finance, invoice, or real estate, or um, stock or bond, things like that, yeah, in, into uh, collateral? Absolutely. So, you know, right now, the protocol very easily accepts any asset that's fungible and on Ethereum. Those are really the limitations. Um, there's a couple other requirements, you know, namely that there's a large enough market for it, that there's liquidity so that if, you know, somebody were to borrow it, liquidators could repay their borrowed position if, you know, they were insolvent, uh, mm -hmm. things like that. But theoretically, the protocol can support more and more assets mm -hmm. as they make their way onto the blockchain. So I think over time, you know, we're going to start to see lots of new asset types besides governance tokens or utility tokens or, you know, different you know, very Ethereum crypto native assets, I think we're going to start to see more, you know, real world assets as they become mainstream on the Ethereum blockchain. 2021, will we see more? <laughs> Any? <laughs> yeah, I think, <laughs> yeah I, I think we'll start to see, you know, flows from the real world in like mm. 2021. Um, you know, but it's important to realize that like, you know, Time is both extremely fast and extremely slow in this industry. You know, we started Compound in 2018 uh, when we launched the first version of it, and people thought it was, you know, kind of crazy at the time. <laughs> you know, and now it seems, you know, very basic and very simple and very primitive. And I think that real world assets on a blockchain are going to feel the same way. At first, they're going to seem crazy and mm. dangerous. They, you know, will look scary to include in a system like Compound. But then over time, they're going to look boring and obvious. And so, you know, I think it'll take a couple of years before they reach the point where it's obvious. Mm -hmm. um, but I see the next couple of years that becoming larger and larger. Mm, wow, it's fascinating. Just 2018 yeah. and now, and we have so much progress in the innovation. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe ask about ETH 2.0. Yeah, how is your thought on uh, ETH 2.0 impact to DeFi ecosystem? Um, will that help serve costs, lower costs? Will that help uh, stimulate more development to the ecosystem, new use cases, things like that? Yeah, so I think that there's, you know, some really big positives and some potential hazards. So the really big positives are that, you know, as E2 rolls out, we're going to see significantly lower transaction costs and a lot more scalability. This is going to mm -hmm. enable some great new experiences and applications. Mm -hmm. And I think like across the board, everyone's gonna be very happy that there's like a low cost of transactions. Mm -hmm. I think the bigger risks though, is that information and data might exist across shards. And you might have a shard that contains all of the existing DeFi today. And it's not as easy or fast to transfer information and state between this group of applications and another group of applications over here. Mm -hmm. And so on Ethereum 1 today, there's extremely high amounts of composability. Every contract on the blockchain is equally as accessible as any other contract on the blockchain, but things are relatively slow and expensive. In E2, we're going to have everything being extremely fast and cheap, but there might be a little bit less composability between different areas of the blockchain. Um, you know, it might, instead of having instant access between different applications, you might have delayed access between applications. Um, and that might create very different experiences. So we'll see what that's like. Um, I'm optimistic. I think on the whole, mm -hmm. there's no way it can be worse than it is today. I think <laughs> it can only be positive, yes. right? Because at a minimum, you could just keep on building in this, you know, section of uh, F2. So mm -hmm. I, I think it'll be, good and positive and i think that it'll you know create some very new applications mm, got it actually e even if one uh, people complain about this congestion and you know gas fee and things like that but i remember you also talk about like you know even all like uh, this expensive or uh, congestion it's still better than traditional finance and that's why the 5c a very good product market fit here on on ethereum yeah it is, but at the same time, 
it's starting to reach its limitations, at least in my mm -hmm. own opinion. Mm -hmm. The reason I say it is, you know, my original vision for Compound was that all balances of assets that weren't being actively used could wind up in a system like Compound. Every smart contract with an asset could send it to Compound. Every user with a balance could send it to Compound. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, all balances, large and small, could wind up in a protocol like this. And that made sense back when gas costs were like one gig away, right? Mm. Um, and interacting with the protocol cost a couple of cents. Now, interacting with the protocol costs a couple of dollars. And so if you have a large balance, it still makes all the sense in the world. You're like, okay, it's, you know, you can measure it. Oh, there's a day of interest. You know, my break even is one day, right? But if you're a small user, the protocol is no longer economical to use. And that, that makes me extremely sad. Um, because I originally like had this vision where you could interact with Compound with $10, right? And you just can't do that anymore. It's the transaction costs are higher than years of interest that you would potentially earn. And so it crowds out all of these small transactions. And so, you know, it still works and it works great, right? For large balances, but it no longer works and is functional at all for smaller users. And, you know, that's one of the biggest limitations that, the blockchain faces right now. Now, that's different for a trading application. I think trading applications will stay more economical for small users because the gas cost as a function of how much you're expecting to make or lose as a user is lower. You know, even if you're trading $100, you know, and it costs you 2 or $3 to make a trade, you're hoping to make 10% in the next couple of days. It's fine. You're willing to do it. It's volatile. But if you're only looking to earn 2 or 3% over a year, by being passive, the economics don't work anymore. So, you know, DeFi still works phenomenally uh, on Ethereum, even though it's expensive for most applications. But the more transactions that go into it, the more it's going to crowd out smaller balances. And the minimum threshold is going to get worse and worse and worse for everyone. Got it. Do you think there is any layer one based protocol that can challenge uh, Ethereum in DeFi? That's a great question. Um, I think time will tell. I think it's going to be really interesting to watch how this shakes out. I mean, personally, I think that ETH2 has, you know, the biggest advantage mm. as of right now, just because everything's already built on Ethereum for the most part. It doesn't mean that you're not going to see DeFi popping up elsewhere. You know, I'm actually really excited to follow a lot of the new applications and other blockchains, but it's still very early. So, you know, I'd love to, you know, come back to that question in a year and we can revisit it and see how Ethereum's network effect has evolved one year forward. Got it. Okay. Yeah, I would love to talk to you again <laughs> in one year or actually even before that. But yeah, we would, sure. would love to come and talk about this. Yeah. Um, so uh, well, how do you see Compound over the next like uh, two years, five years, 10 years from now? Yeah, how do you see it evolve? Yeah, that's a great question. So I see it, you know, scaling on two separate axes. So the first is, you know, horizontally with the number of markets that it can support, you know, and this goes to your earlier question. Do I see like real world assets, you know, becoming a part of this? Yes. I think over time, you're going to get more and more markets and more and more types of assets. Eventually we're going to have stocks and bonds and currencies and, you know, all sorts of tokenized real estate and all sorts of things in a system like Compound. And the second is scaling vertically with integrations. You know, right now, you know, Compound is a protocol that many people still access directly, but I think that you're going to see Compound as a back end get built into more and more systems like custodians, exchanges, wallets, and new applications. And the next couple of years are going to be filled with Compound, you know, being usable through more and more places. Mm -hmm. Got it. All right. Yeah, I think uh, that's pretty much time for today. Thank you so much, Robert, for spending time with us and really would love you to come back again. I always tell everybody that uh, Robert is like the best person uh, for DeFi to come and talk to a regulator because like you understand traditional finance, you understand DeFi, you are the, the coder yourself, very active in um, looking at the code of um, the protocol as well. So yeah, thank you and um, would love to have you back. And last time you told me that um, you came for vacation in Thailand last December, I think. So when we can travel again, I hope you can come back to Thailand. Maybe we go meet in Phuket <laughs> next time. That sounds good. Okay. Well, thanks for having me.
cool. Thanks so much, Rohit. Awesome. Bye.